Welcome everyone. The webinar will begin shortly and will be recorded. Connect with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading on social media. On Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR. On Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. And on LinkedIn, follow us at Campaign for GLR. Please use hashtag Learning Tuesdays and tag us to tweet anything you learn from today's webinar, and we'll be sure to retweet. We encourage you to share your questions, reflections, and observations on social media. Once again, we would love to connect. So on Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR. On Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. And on LinkedIn, follow us at Campaign for GLR. Okay, welcome again, everyone, to today's webinar. My name is Sierra Sanchez, and I'll be behind the scenes helping to produce this conversation. I have just a few housekeeping details before we get started. First, we would love for you to introduce yourself. So please use the chat box at the bottom of the screen to share your name, city or state and your organization. When responding, be sure to select both panelists and attendees so that we all know who is here. All attendees are in listen only mode, but we encourage you to post any questions that you may have during the conversation into the Q&A box. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording, as well as all resources shared as links in the chat, will be compiled and shared in a follow-up email to all webinar registrants. Finally, we'll be posting a brief on-screen evaluation during closing and highly encourage you to respond. This helps us with our commitment to continuous improvement. Finally, before we begin, I would like to call your attention to some of our upcoming GLR Learning Tuesdays webinars. Next week on June 21st, we have an exciting doubleheader, starting with a funder to funder conversation on convening for greater impact more than money philanthropy, followed at 3 p.m. Eastern time by aligning state and local investments for durable change. Then we'll invite you to round off the month of June with us for a session on Ready for Children, Seamless Transitions into Kindergarten. Registration and more information for these sessions will be posted in the chat box now, and we hope you can join us. Joining you now is Hattie Miles Polka, Senior Consultant with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you and thank you for joining us for today's GLR Learning Tuesdays webinar, Stabilizing the Early Care and Educational Workforce, Increasing Compensation ASAP. The early care and education workforce is facing an urgent crisis in filling positions and retaining staff to provide the essential care needed by families. Yet quality childcare and education continue to be incredibly important to the long-term success and well-being of children. A major cause of the current shortage stems from a long-standing battle over fair compensation for professionals in this field and a lack of widespread addressing of this issue. We're lucky enough to be joined today by researchers, state policymakers, employers, and the educators in this arena today who will present data revealing the core causes of the current staffing shortage and explore solutions to the compensation challenge. I'm now gonna make brief introductions to our presenters, discussants, and our moderator, and then turn it over to our moderator. Next slide, please, thank you. Dr. Caitlin McLean has over a decade of research experience in early care and education systems and policy. As Director of Multi-State and International Programs at the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment at UC Berkeley, she leads cross-state early care and education workforce policy projects, such as the Biennial Early Childhood Workforce Index, as well as related research on ECE compensation initiatives and workforce data. She also provides and oversees technical assistance to state level stakeholders looking to improve their policies to support early educators. Dr. McLean holds a PhD in social policy from the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. Anna Markowitz is a psychologist whose work lies at the intersection of developmental psychology and child and family policy. Her research focuses on policy supports for early child development with an emphasis on the well being of children and families from minoritized and marginalized groups. For the past five years, Dr. Markowitz has co-led a research policy partnership with the Louisiana Department of Education, working to inform their early care and education workforce policy. Dr. Markowitz holds an MA in Applied Developmental and Educational Psychology from Boston College, and both a master's in public policy and PhD in psychology from Georgetown University. 
Next, Jenna Conway leads the Virginia Department of Education's efforts to ensure all Virginia children have the opportunity to enter kindergarten ready. For more than a decade, she has led transformative efforts in different states to change how we see, fund, and manage our birth to five public private early childhood care and education systems with a keen focus on increasing access and parent choice, improving classroom quality, and better engaging families. Jamila Jordan serves as the executive director of the Illinois Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development, where she supports the development and implementation of early childhood policy across multiple state agencies. Dr. Jordan has over 35 years of experience in the field of early care and education and has served in various leadership and service positions, including vice president of the governing board for the National Association for the Education of Young Children. Jerlitha McDonald is the Senior Manager of Membership and Volunteer Affairs for the National Association for Family Child Care. She is a social entrepreneur, a family child care business consultant, and a national speaker. She has a bachelor's degree in child development and family studies with a minor in early childhood intervention from Stephen F. Austin State University. Jerlitha is the founder of the Arlington DFW Child Care Professionals Association, hosts her highly acclaimed radio and visual podcast show, The Jolita McDonald Show, Everything Child Care, serves as the co-chair for the National Family Child Care Panel, and she is also a member and co-chair of the Early Learning Alliance Child Care Provider Council, a member of the Arlington, Texas MLK Planning Committee, and the Arlington Black Chamber of Commerce. In April of 2016, Jolita was recognized by the Grand Prairie NAACP as one of the most influential women in business, and in 2020 received the North Texas Early Childhood Leadership Award from Child Care Associates. Tanja Rucker currently serves as the Director for Early Childhood Success in the Institute for Youth Education and Families at the National League of Cities. She is responsible for, the, for driving the creation and refinement of a strategic early learning agenda and overseeing the execution of innovative and high impact technical assistance in cities. Tanja works directly with mayors, city council members and other municipal officials in creating local systems of support for young children and builds alliances with national partners. Prior to joining the NLC team, Tanja served as the transition coordinator for Baltimore City and as an adjunct professor at the University of Maryland College Park. She serves on a variety of boards and committees. She has a doctorate in human development from the University of Maryland College Park and a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Spelman College. And as we begin our conversation, I'm honored to welcome and introduce our esteemed moderator, Dr. Jacqueline Jones, who will make some framing remarks before we hear from everyone. As president and CEO at the Foundation for Child Development, Dr. Jacqueline Jones is responsible for developing and implementing the foundation's strategic vision and goals. Prior to her tenure at the Foundation for Child Development, Dr. Jones served as a senior advisor on the early learning to Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, and as the country's first deputy assistant secretary for policy and early learning in the U.S. Department of Education. Prior to her position in the Obama administration, Dr. Jones served as the assistant commissioner for the Division of Early Childhood Education in the New Jersey State Department of Education and as a senior research scientist at the Educational Testing Service in Princeton for over 15 years. Dr. Jones has been a visiting faculty member at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and a full-time faculty member at the City University of New York. She received both her master's and PhD degrees from Northwestern University. And now I will turn it over to you, Jacqueline. Thank you so much, Hattie. Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to moderate this afternoon's discussion of the early care and education workforce. Providing professionals who facilitate young children's growth and development with the tools they need to do their work will require coordinated efforts that include high quality preparation programs, ongoing professional learning and support, and compensation that reflects the professional competence needed to do the work effectively. In 2015, the Institute on Medicine produced the consensus report, Transforming the Workforce for Children Birth Through Age Eight, and the National Academies Press in 2018 published the companion consensus report, Transforming the Financing of Early Care and Education. These two publications outlined the state of the science of early development, the foundational core of knowledge and competencies, the kind of fundamentals that teachers need, the differential, differentiated specialized knowledge for a variety of early care and education roles, and then the cost of high quality when appropriate compensation is factored into the mix. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the centrality of childcare for the overall economy. It has also shown what happens when we do not pay attention to the professional, emotional, and financial needs of those who care for and educate young children. And that brings us to today's discussion, which will focus on the need for more appropriate compensation and support if we are to retain the workforce we have and attract a new generation of professionals as we try to stabilize the field. While the challenges are big, the future of early care and education rests on our ability to maintain and support a well-prepared, diverse, and well-compensated workforce. We have a terrific panel today, and they will help us see this issue from multiple perspectives, from policy at the state and municipal levels, and research, and from the voice of the practitioner. So there's probably the best place to start is with an organization that has been doing this work for a very long time. And so Caitlin, well, you get to start because the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment has been a, a leader in studying the workforce before it was quite fashionable. So I leave it to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Welcome everyone. So as mentioned, I'm a researcher at the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment. And over the past two decades, our center has been working to improve the way our nation prepares, supports, and compensates early childhood educators of children birth through five through our research and our policy analysis. Increasingly, uh, oh, next slide, please. Increasingly, many people do understand that the early care and education field is in crisis, and that this crisis is a direct result of decades of policy choices that have consistently let down the women who are doing this essential work. We know that working in childcare programs is one of the worst paying jobs that you can have in this country. Our research shows that 98% of other occupations earn more than childcare teachers. As a result, early childhood educators face poverty rates on average nearly eight times higher than poverty rates for K through eight teachers. Nearly half of childcare teachers live in households that must rely on assistance like food stamps in order to survive and, and to take care of their families. Now consider that nearly all early childhood educators are women and many are women of color. And even within early care and education, women of color face wage disparities. Our research has found that black educators in particular earn just 78 cents on the dollar that their white peers earn. You may have heard many of these data points before in policy discussions, in the many important news articles that have come out over the past two years as the pandemic has exacerbated the early care and education workforce crisis. And now you know where they come from. As part of our biennial Early Childhood Workforce Index report, we have been working to shine a spotlight on low pay and poor working conditions that early childhood educators face across the country. Next slide, please. But you may not know that as part of our index, we also examine and assess state efforts to make progress on a variety of policies, including compensation. As of 2020, you can see just how few states were investing public funds and solutions to the low pay problem. But the good news is that there have been more recent efforts from the federal to the local levels to help relieve the immense financial stress that educators face every day and which has only gotten worse since the pandemic. With American Rescue Plan and other COVID relief funds, many states and localities have jumped at the opportunity to invest in the early care and education workforce, even as we know much more needs to be done. But even with this new funding, decision makers in states and localities continue to grapple with the question of how do we make appropriate compensation for early childhood educators a reality? Next slide, please. So over the past year, our research center developed two new projects to help answer that question. The first is a database of mostly state, but also some tribal and local initiatives 
to raise wages, provide benefits, or at least to provide additional income for early educators. We track the type of strategy, how it was funded, how funding flows to the educator and the amount, eligibility and equity considerations, as well as data on impact, where we can find it. And we've heard from policymakers and advocates who have used the database to understand what others are doing as they craft their own solutions. We've also launched a learning community of advocates, administrators, and legislators from seven states, all committed to being bold on early care and education compensation. We've been convening since January, talking about issues like how do you create and use a salary scale? How do you use cost models to figure out how much funding you need? And how do you approach benefits like health insurance? We're posting the materials from each of our convenings on our website, so you can find those there. And even though we've only um, gotten through about half the year of our learning community, we've already learned a lot about what it takes to move forward. So I wanna end my comments with just three key points. First, raising wages is crucial, but we can't forget benefits like health insurance, paid sick leave, and retirement. While no one quite has the answer yet, we know that states like Washington are trying out innovations like paying for childcare teachers' healthcare premiums on the state exchange. Two, collecting data on early childhood educators to understand who benefits and who doesn't from new initiatives is more important than you think. And lastly, we can't do right by early educators or for kids or for parents until we invest sustained, significant public funding in our early care and education system. The fact is that we can't fix compensation on short-term, time-limited dollars. Thanks very much. Thank you, Caitlin. And now, Anna, if you would share your findings. Great, thanks so much. And thanks, Dr. McLean, for uh, setting this up so nicely. So. Um, just to sort of transition, whereas Dr. McLean uh, talked us through um, some of what we know about compensation, I'm going to talk a little bit about what that might mean for early educators and how that links us uh, to the crisis that we're currently experiencing now. Um, every time I speak, I like to say um, something that I'm sure everyone in this room is quite aware of, but the work of early educators is high skill work that requires specific knowledge and competencies. Um, it's challenging and demanding, it's fun. Teachers are the most essential ingredient in high quality early care and education, that's sort of well known. And they spend their time working hard to build high quality environments that are warm and sustaining for children where they're some more supported emotionally and challenged intellectually. So this is, um, equivalent if not more difficult to the work of older uh, teachers of older children. Yet as Dr. McLean noted, uh, these educators often earn very little and are under supported in their contexts. In fact, in the data that I'm about to share from Louisiana, um, we find that childcare teachers on average make $20,000 a year with some teachers in our data, data making as little as $7.25 an hour, the federal minimum wage. And we assert that this will have implications for their practice and their well being. So, what I have here is some of our data out of a few uh, Louisiana communities that we've been working with since 2018. Um, we've been fielding workforce surveys in these communities that we sent out to all teachers working um, in childcare settings that uh, receive public funds. So, they serve children with childcare subsidies. And this is about 70% of all centers. Um, when we field these surveys, we hear back from about uh, 60 to 80% of teachers, de depending on the year. Um, we like to highlight this because it's often difficult to hear the voices of early educators in research. As Dr. McLean noted, we don't have good data systems for childcare, and um, that can be challenging, particularly when trying to understand something like well being, as educators that are struggling may be less likely um, to respond. So we feel like we have a better snapshot here than is typically available. So the left uh, bars here show um, depression data from 2019 and 2020. And we show you this so we can say, uh, so sort of a pre-pandemic baseline and then the observed difference in the wake of COVID-19. Um, I wanna note here that the 22% um, of childcare teachers reporting clinically le relevant levels of depression um, is quite high. The rate for women that same year nationally was about 10%. So we see sort of more than twice here. 
And then we see um, this large jump um, in the wake of COVID about um, 30%. Um, part of the reason that depression may be high is because teachers uh, do struggle uh, with economic anxiety. So here on the right-hand side, you can see data on food insecurity. Uh, food insecurity is essentially not knowing that you'll be able to access enough food for yourself and for your family. Um, in 2019, the national rate of food insecurity was 10.5%. You can see here then 2019, the rate of food insecurity we saw among the early educators who responded to our survey was 57%. Um, so this is quite high, and I, I want to reiterate here that this is data from educators working full-time jobs, working and caring for young children. Um, this did not change appreciably with the um, advent of COVID-19. And if, uh, next slide, please. Corresponding to these challenges, we do see a large number of teachers leaving um, the profession. And uh, this is sort of what we're here to talk about today, this link between compensation and turnover. Again, globally, it's hard to estimate teacher turnover um, in child care center, but we're able to leverage a unique data source from Louisiana to present for the first time um, the teacher turnover rate sort of statewide across, again, all sites uh, where teachers are, uh, sites are receiving public funds. So this is all teachers working in sites that receive public funds in Louisiana. Um, to orient you to the figure, what the line is showing you is the proportion of teachers working in child care centers in the fall of 2016 that we see again each fall and each spring until the fall of 2019. So for example, you see this one in the upper left-hand corner because that's the fall of 2016 and that's our whole sample, that's everybody. You can see that our next time point, the spring of 2017, we've dropped down to 0.8, so that's 80%. Um, that means that 20% of our teachers had left uh, their sites just in that short time period. By the following fall, just one year after our first data point, you see that 0.56 there. That means that 44% of teachers have left. This is an annual turnover rate of nearly 50%. And when you fast forward to three falls later, the fall of 2019, you can see that 75% of teachers that we observed in the fall of 2016 were no longer working at their sites. This is a tremendous loss to the profession and makes the work of both leading childcare sites and providing high quality care extremely difficult. Next slide. And of course, um, my data are showing what this looked like prior to COVID-19, that these challenges and stressors have existed in childcare for a long time, as uh, Dr. McLean and Dr. Jones were noting. Um, but there's good reason to believe that the pandemic exacerbated these issues. Working with young children during COVID was very challenging. Many early educators were asked to take on not only new risks, but new roles um, as they continued to work with young children. And as wages went up in other jobs, many teachers left for that sort of security. Um, so what is this looking like on the ground? Besides the news um, surveys that you've heard in recent statewide data from Louisiana, so this is a survey that went out to all leaders um, of childcare sites in Louisiana. We heard back from about 80% of them. 35% of childcare sites said that they were, uh, there were at least 25% vacant in terms of staff. 95% reported that it was challenging to find and hire replacement teachers, and nearly half said they were turning away children and families because of these challenges. Um, I think the voices of the leaders here really uh, say it best. Um, so these are two quotes from some of our leaders in Louisiana. Teacher turnover has created many challenges for us. Losing teachers and finding quality candidates that want to work have been, has been our biggest challenge. This hurts our current employees, hurts our enrollment, and can really negatively affect the children who need stability and routine. I need to be able to pay my teachers a livable wage. It's not fair for them to work so hard but be compensated so little. Many of them are becoming tired of the small checks and are talking about finding other work. Their jobs are important. We are the reason parents are able to go to work or school. Um, so as Dr. Jones sort of started us with, it's clear that childcare is the backbone of this country and the backbone of young children's experiences. Um, and that's why I'm so excited to be part of this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that uh, both sets of, of data highlight how important this conversation is, uh, not just uh, for compensation itself, but for the larger issue of just stabilizing the field and making sure we are able to provide high quality care and education for young children. So Caitlin, I'm going to start with you. You know, your center has been involved in, in this work for a long time, looking at issues around policy. Is there a, like a single most important next step 
in policy and practice that you would like to see? Absolutely, thanks Jacqueline. The single most important next step that I would like to see is for the federal government to pass major public investment in early care and education, but in particular with specific funding allocated toward compensation. We saw with the American Rescue Plan and other COVID relief efforts that states and localities can create solutions when the funding is there. But we also know that states are facing a possible fiscal cliff when that relief funding comes to an end. And it's so important that we maintain and build on the progress that we have made during the pandemic with states you know, prioritizing compensation and their stabilization grants, um, really encouraging and help and supporting programs to raise wages and, and um, give bonuses to staff where they can. Um, but none of this can continue without that sustained funding. Right. Thank you. And, and Anna, you know, your data is so compelling about turnover. You wonder how anyone keeps a, a center running with these kinds of numbers. What's the impact of teacher well being and teacher turnover on the quality of programs for families and children? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's such an important part of this conversation in general. So I think the conversation the country is having now is around stability and access and parents saying, oh, I, you know, where's my kid going to go? But it's also the case that when educators are struggling, they are not um, as well equipped to provide the kinds of high quality care that we know young children need. I think, again, for the folks in the room, the idea that early educators need to be sort of patient and on their game all the time is not surprising. And so it perhaps won't surprise you to know there's a lot of empirical data that shows a relationship, for example, between teacher depression and the quality of the interactions they have with young children. The teachers are less likely to spend time um, talking to young children, that the warmth in their relationships um, is lower. There's also some work that links um, teacher stress and anxiety, for example, to children's behavior problems um, at the end of the year. And so we've sort of seen that um, play out uh, you know, for young children, both in terms of the quality they're receiving and for their outcomes. Interesting. Caitlin, I don't know if you have a, a perspective on this, this notion of the relationship between well-being, turnover, and, and program quality. Yes, I do. I agree with so much that, that Anna said. Um, I mean, I think the, the thing to keep in mind is not only is there incredible turnover, but programs can't even get people in um, to, to kind of fill those, those vacancies. So when we're thinking about you know, workforce issues, we can't be thinking about them as sort of separate or you know, not as important as issues for children and families. Because if we don't support educators, then there aren't early care and education services for children and families. Um, and as Anna mentioned, there have been you know, many studies and, and our own research center has looked at this as well that have shown you know, the, the immense financial and emotional stresses that educators have been under that have just gotten worse under the pandemic. And if you think about yourself and how, how you feel when you're tired and you're stressed, you know, how can we expect so much from educators and you know, support them with so little? So if we want quality services for kids and families, we have to invest in the educators who are delivering those services. Can I just talk on uh, one thing there? So a couple of folks have um, asked this in the chat as well. So I, I wanna address it because it's related, but um, most of the educators were able to track whether or not they transition from sites or they leave teaching altogether. We actually don't see them show up in other childcare centers. We just see them leaving the profession. So also when we talk about sort of supporting teachers, helping them develop their practice, getting their skills on the ground, um, we're sort of losing any investment that we put into those educators learning and growing their skills when they you know, leave the workforce entirely, which makes it also difficult to sort of support high quality center climates and just high quality practice in general. It's very interesting because as we have our conversations around building high quality programs, the, the notion that appropriate compensation for teachers is not in that mix is kind of baffling. Uh, I, I'm wondering if you know of, of places, and we're gonna hear uh, from some city work and some work around the states, 
but if in your research, where are there places where folks have really been trying to address turnover and compensation in some way that has been effective? Do you have some a few examples you might give us? We're going to hear from Virginia and Illinois, so don't steal their thunder. Um, I can jump in. I, I'm really impressed with the recent work from DC. Um, you know, this they've been working for a long time, so it's not like this came out of nowhere, but their task force, um, you know, recently released their recommendations around how are they going to achieve pay parity for their infant and toddler teachers, which they've been working toward. Um, and then they finally raised the revenue, which is what kind of <laughs> has pushed things over the edge here, um, that they raise local revenue uh, dedicated to making sure that their infant and toddler teachers um, are paid more and can be paid in line with, with other teachers. Um, and so that's the model that I look to when, when folks say, what should we be doing? I'm saying, look at DC, because they've been thinking really hard about how do you do this over the long term? So creating a salary scale, making sure that they have the, the public investment there to get to programs. Um, but also thinking about the short term, really recognizing the crisis that programs and educators are in. And so making sure that uh, even while they're thinking through all of the implementation details, they are they have a strategy in place to make sure that educators receive um, kind of short term stipends um, to really help relieve some of that financial stress. Yeah, I can talk in a little bit. So um, as sort of uh, Caitlin intimated, many states have used funding that they've received um, from the Biden administration to give these sort of short-term bonuses or to sort of do these kind of quick injections to stabilize. Um, so Louisiana, for example, where we're working, took a bunch of money and uh, created what's called the teacher support grants, which is just sort of these injections of funds into childcare centers with the instruction to use it for compensation in some capacity. So we're collecting a bunch of data on this now, but many of uh, the directors are reporting just what we um, heard from Dr. McLean. I'm giving bonuses because I don't know if this money is going to continue and persist. And I don't know that this bonus is gonna be enough. And I'm worried that I'm gonna lose the teachers shortly after the bonus goes out. So you hear this sort of call for um, sustainability and stability. Um, I also know that New Mexico has been working on a new funding model um, that prioritizes educator compensation, um, similar to what is happening in the District of Columbia that Dr. McLean brought up, and um, hopefully Jenna Conway from Virginia can talk a little bit um, about how they're trying to do that as well. Thanks, Anna. You know, I, I, I have to interject that in my own state of New Jersey, uh, the Abbott Preschool Program, or formerly known as Abbott Preschool Program, really did try to stabilize the workforce by trying to create pay parity. And this was across a mixed delivery system. Uh, I have to say that that came as a result of a, a court order uh, and uh, it came out of the general fund. So, you know, I, I, I insist on thinking that we don't figure out how we pay third grade teachers. It's just fascinating to me that we struggle with how we pay uh, preschool teachers. We find a way when we when we have to find a way. Um, thank you. I think I think the the data you've shown has given us a sense of of the gravity of the situation uh, for for the workforce itself and for young children and the implications that that this means for quality. So I would like to hear now from some of the folks who were working in states and really trying to figure out how at the state level to address this. So Jamila, if you would come on and give us a sense of what's going on in Illinois and what are the things that, that Illinois is trying to do to address the, uh, the kinds of issues that, that Anna and Caitlin have, have, uh, have shared with us. So thank you so much, uh, Jacqueline. Thank you very much, uh, first of all, for the invitation to uh, participate in this conversation and to be a part of the GLR Learning Tuesday webinar. So within Illinois, we are exploring several, um, you know, strategies related to supporting educator compensation. Uh, the first is our Accelerate Child Care Center pilot program, which has a focus on our rural, our rural communities uh, within the state. 
Our second program is referred to as our Strengthen and Grow Child Care Grants. This is funded uh, through the American Rescue Plan Act uh, funds. This is across our system. And the third uh, that I'd like to highlight is our Great Start program. And START is an acronym for Strategy to Attract and re Retain uh, Teachers. Uh, the Accelerate Child Care uh, pilot program is made uh, possible by a federal grant, our preschool development grant, uh, Birth to Five. And again, we are focusing on our rural communities within the state, primarily what we refer to as our group two uh, counties uh, within the state. Uh, those programs that are part of our state's child care assistance program, as well as those programs that are serving at least 40% of, of children who receive uh, child care assistance um, within our state. Uh, the individuals, the participants in this program as part of br bridging compensation and quality are uh, currently testing a new quality rating and improvement system framework as part of this compensation uh, you know, strategy uh, so that we can what we call upfront um, uh, funding to provide funding upfront to address their uh, circle of quality, their rating within our child care program. But also, uh, you know, as we think about the framework is funding for incremental costs uh, within the program that's entirely staffing uh, related. And so it's for all of those positions that go above and beyond licensing, uh, able to receive additional support as it relates to uh, compensation. This has been really significant, uh, you know, for us because we've been, again, thanks to the preschool development grant, uh, we've been able to implement this program during a very, very challenging time during the pandemic. Um, during which time it was going against the goal, you talked about stabilizing, going against the goal of trying to have a stable, adequate and compensated uh, you know, workforce. So we have 35 programs that are currently participating uh, in this initiative. Uh, we have realized uh, uh, some impact to date in that uh, you know, the pilot uh, program has helped us through our rate wage scale to support our infantile workforce. Uh, in addition, uh, we have seen increases in credential attainment uh, during this time, as well as a uh, result of the, um, the compensation. Uh, individuals have also noted, I did see uh, a question regarding working conditions uh, as a result of this uh, uh, pilot program. Uh, individuals have been able to uh, engage in reflective practice because they've been able to address their staffing patterns as well as improve other uh, working uh, conditions. And so we've been able to, you know, make adjustments to the model uh, that makes it sustainable. And, uh, you know, we look forward to, uh, you know, moving forward uh, in this state. Uh, with this initiative. Then we have our Strengthen and Grow, uh, you know, grants program. Uh, as I mentioned, again, this, uh, the goal of this program is to stabilize our um, early educators to offset the, uh, the impact of, of COVID. And so uh, the grants are uh, a minimum of, a minimum of 50% of those grant funds must be used to increase compensation or to support benefits uh, for uh, staff within those programs. Uh, these grant funds are available for child care centers, uh, child care homes, as well as uh, group child care uh, homes. Uh, you probably heard yesterday, Governor Pritzker uh, during his press conference yesterday announced that the Strengthen and Grow Grants uh, program will be extended through June of 2023. So we are really uh, excited about that opportunity. And then the last uh, compensation uh, strategy that I wanted to share is related to uh, Great Start. As I mentioned, uh, Start is an acronym for uh, strategy to attract and retain teachers. And this program, um, is at the, it's a wage supplement program, it's uh, paid directly to uh, the, the educator, um, and the supplement, it supplements the individual's income, and it also speaks to retention, is that as long as that individual is within that program, they are, they continue to be compensated, 
uh, they receive a check approximately every six months. And so again, uh, addressing compensation as well as retention uh, within our different programs. So those are the three strategies that you know, I wanted to you know, share with our uh, audience uh, today. Thank you, Jamila. And if and if anyone in the audience has more questions for Jamila, please put them in the chat, and we'll make sure we address them during the Q and A. And then I think uh, you know, for our audience as well, uh, there are uh, links as well. So. Uh, yes. I, I went through the information quickly, but have provided links for you so that you can receive detailed information about each of the initiatives that I uh, that I mentioned. Thanks so much, Jamila. You're welcome. And Jenna, can you take about five minutes to share with us what's what's happening in Virginia? Excellent. Thank you. This is a fantastic session, and I appreciate being invited as well as seeing some of the research from across the country and from a state that I'm quite familiar with, uh, Louisiana, as well as hearing about what's happening in New Jersey and Illinois. Uh, in Virginia, we are, just to put it mildly, obsessed with thinking about teacher compensation, um, not, not only as it relates to what's going on with the very real challenges around attracting staff, but fundamentally we think there are deep, deep connections between uh, turnover and quality, and that we will never sort of achieve continual quality improvement or quality at scale kind of across a public private system until we get to more fair and competitive compensation, um, you know, in order to sort of drive better outcomes for kids. The key steps we've taken over the course of the last few years in Virginia is one, bringing everybody into one house, so unifying oversight of the public private system family child care, child care, early Head Start, Head Start, early child and special education and state pre-K at the Department of Education, recognizing everybody as educators and enabling one state agency to speak with one voice about health, safety and learning, and then thinking about how you fund your programs, all of them across the sector to meet those expectations. Part of that also was, also was a a required measurement and improvement system that's inclusive of all programs that take public dollars from your family child care to your large school division. Um, but we were a little bit unique in how we approached the development and scaling of that statewide measurement and improvement system because we have always attached it to an educator incentive. So we call it Recognize B5. We started uh, through a research policy partnership with the University of Virginia and found uh, through a randomized control uh, study that providing educators the equivalent of 75 cents more per hour, $1,500 cut turnover in half. Um, and from there, from the last four years, we have attached for every new program that's participating in our quality measurement and improvement system as it scales, uh, all of the educators who work at publicly funded programs that are not schools, because we found no effect there, um, are eligible for a direct incentive not tied to a credential, simply based on doing that work and being part of these, these higher expectations, this measurement and improvement system. We also have a very simple measurement and improvement system. We focus on interactions uh, and we support the use of approved curriculum in at least one classroom. Um, but we're doing that at scale. And for scale in Virginia means rolling out the class system of measures to about 9,000 classrooms statewide. But uh, for the last two years, our educators have been eligible for $2,000. Um, and we're hoping to grow that this year. Uh, and we use that small PDG grant to basically build the case this works in Virginia. And then we're able, we're just steps away from a final Virginia budget, but it looks like our legislature has put in a $20 million investment over two years, direct pay to childcare educators. Uh, that's a short-term fix. Um, as much as we love recognize B5 cutting checks this year to 6,000 next year educators, next year to 10,000 educators, and sustaining that is really challenging. Um, and so we are, we added language to our state budget this year to basically hold the Department of Education responsible for funding state pre-K, state pre-K and private settings known as mixed delivery and childcare subsidy using a cost-based approach. We just got approval from the feds on alternate methodology and we are starting to peg, our model will peg a childcare teacher to the K-12 local teacher. It will be a proportion, um, recognizing that not all of our childcare teachers may have bachelors or teacher licenses, but we think it's important to sort of philosophically and actually 
shift from thinking as childcare teaching as a minimum wage uh, sort of job to something that is pegged to whatever the K2, uh, K-12, K-2 teacher salaries are. Um, and lastly, what's been really important in effort, and you hear sort of the remnants of how Anna and team are supporting Louisiana, we deeply believe in research policy, policy partnerships. So RCTs to measure the effectiveness of our um, incentives, constant surveys of families, educators, um, and working with our research partners at UVA to also build one of the first data systems in the country that captures classroom quality, excuse me, down to the classroom level. I'll simplify it, but basically what we're building is a system that will say, here's how many classrooms you have, not sites, programs, or funding sources, but classrooms. Here's the kids who are in that classroom. Here's the quality elements affiliated with that classroom, class scores, curriculum use, turnover, teacher compensation, credential, um, and here's how kids grew within that system. And longitudinally, here's how kids, the sort of kids coming to, to kindergarten ready, third grade results, connecting to Virginia's longitudinal data system. So it's bits and pieces. We're a year away from kind of being at full scale, but we're hoping that not only will we be able to get um, teachers uh, better paid and better kind of compensated, but we'll be able to show that it matters um, and building out a system that we can not only look at outcomes, but children's growth as kind of a function of turnover of compensation and really building the case for paying our teachers what they deserve to be paid. This is very interesting, Jenna, this the notion of, of real time um, sort of data driven policy making. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have a, more, a lot more questions around that. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the things that we hardly ever do is hear the voice of practitioners as we have these discussions around policy and research. And we're really very lucky today that Jalitha is able to join us to really speak to what it means uh, for family child care in particular, but just to give us the voice of the practitioner. So Jalitha, you've been listening to all of this. And I'm only going to give you five minutes like, <laughs> to, to react and give us the perspective of, of practitioners on this. Well, I will say, first of all, thank you all for having me. My name is Jalitha McDonald from National Association for Family Child Care. And my role there is um, membership management and affiliate building for family child care associations and networks. And um, what you guys have said it over and over and over again, and I will say it in one word, that is compensation. Compensation is huge right now, especially when it comes to um, family child care providers. And why, why, why would I say that? Because compensation includes health insurance benefits, could you imagine family child care providers? We kept our doors open through the whole pandemic, the whole two years. And I will say maybe about 60% of those providers, maybe more, did it without health insurance. So could you imagine going through a pandemic without health insurance? Not only health insurance, dental insurance, eye vision insurance. And um, some others on the panel said it today, how it has, has been really stressful, um, mental health issues. So not having access to um, just, just the basic right of health insurance, um, that, so that right there is um, one of the main factors that uh, we are seeing in, with family child care providers is the lack of health insurance. Um, also retirement plans. Family child care providers have been doing this work for many years, and some family child care providers retire without having a retirement plan. And so sometimes their retirement is going to work in Walmart or going to work in another job just so they can maintain their lifestyle. And so making sure that they have retirement plans. Um, financial stability. So financial stability, especially in um, family child care, creates economic mobility, right? And so making sure that they have the, the tools and resources to live a high quality lifestyle and to run high quality, sustainable family child care businesses. And so that is, that is one of the main things that is missing and that will help with retention and also recruiting younger, um, um, younger providers into this profession because this is a great profession. This is an essential profession and this is profession is needed. And family child care is the workforce behind the workforce. They do 
phenomenal, amazing work. And uh, we need to make sure we invest in them. So I don't like to always talk about the problems. I like to talk about the solutions. And some of the solutions that can um, be solved right now, especially in states all over America, is direct investment. Direct investment in family child care networks and associations. Not just any family child care networks and associations. Family child care networks that directly invest and family child care providers in their states. And what I mean by that, providing financial literacy, providing business development, and providing biz, um, business development, and just providing basic resources that directly affect family child care providers. So that's it. Nice, thank you so much. Thank you. And, and now Tanja Rucker has this wonderful job of being able to work with mayors in cities. And so I'm always fascinated by the work at the state level and the federal level. But, you know, I think the closer you get to the people, the closer you get to the cities is where some of the action really is happening. So Tanja, we are so happy to have you here today and would love to hear your perspective on what cities are doing as they in mayors as they think about this issue, which I'm sure has come up uh, as they've tried to build high quality preschool programs or early learning programs. Yes, thank you, Dr. Jones. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be with you all. What a hard act to follow, Jalitha. I'm like, okay, you set me up. Okay, but I'll, I'll do my best. But I think I want to take you on the road with me, Jalitha, because part of what Dr. Jones just alluded to, um, you know, I work at the National League of Cities, and since 1947, you know, we are the voice of America's cities, towns, and villages. We have about 2,000 member cities, and um, we are kind of the go-to place for municipal governments. And so, you know, we all just take a moment and think about like the past two years. It's been an incredible journey, and um, you know what we have certainly um, we've always known, but certainly I think it's prevalent and for everyone is that local government can is uniquely positioned to be a driver of change. And you know whether you live in a city or a town or a village, you know those leaders are on the front lines and are often left with execution and implementation and to really get things done. And so as we think about how we come out of COVID and the just the, the tumultuous times of the past two years one of the most important responsibilities of local government is, you know, to maintain and improve, um, you know, safety and, and economic stability. And, and so the, the, the conversation that we're having today is, is front and center for many of our, our elected officials at the local level. You know, as a result of COVID child care and, and in turn, the workers were deemed as essential and important and an important sector that needs to be heard and have a seat at decision-making tables. And that something that me and my team that we're tasked to do is to elevate the importance of this sector and to really challenge our members to think about what programs and what policies um, can be implemented to really support the workers who are in their day in, as Jalitha just described, you know, during times when, you know, there's a need to keep the economy moving, those workers, how elected officials, what are the levers of government that can be utilized to support that sector? And so that's why we get up every day and do the work that we do to make sure that we're not just looking at the traditional infrastructure, but we're looking at human infrastructure, the people, the human capital that really are the, the foundation of keeping a city and an economy moving and thriving and going forward. So with support from the Foundation for Child Development, we've been able to um, work with our member cities to really elevate the issue and the importance of child care and the workers as an essential sector. And um, one of the things that we've seen, certainly from some of the dollars um, that have come through the federal government, some of the tremendous investments, and my colleagues have noted just a little bit earlier, um, you know, how we see, have seen dollars that are being and utilized to um, enhance um, the, the compensation, the wages and salaries. And there's a number of what one of the things that we do is kind of follow and track at the municipal level how some of those dollars are being utilized. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll just surface um, Boston. Um, they have funded a, a child care entrepreneur fund, which provides grants and technical assistance to family child care providers, Julita. And so I, I certainly wanted to um, lift that up for you. And um, they have created an 
upper child care workforce incentive grant program that provides directly grants to child care, um, family child care workers and businesses who in the city who've hired new staff or are trying to um, rehire previously staff that have left. And so part of that grant is really around that organizational capacity. Um, the work in the district has been referenced as well. Uh, we have some of our larger cities like San Francisco and Seattle, who for years have been using some of their um, general fund dollars. It's not just the federal, I think Jacqueline, you mentioned that, it's not just federal investments, but how can city use some of those local um, dollars out of their general fund? And so, um, and also to use um, local revenue dollars, tax dollars to infuse and support and provide compensation. And so San Francisco has been doing that for quite a while. Um, as well as San Francisco and a um, little small town, like far from the DC, um, Alexandra has been using some work, some dollars to stabilize um, some of their childcare providers and grants around safety and health and also some stipends for workers. So there's a lot of ways that cities are leveraging federal dollars, but also with their general funds are also using dollars to support um, the workforce, that sector. I do wanna say that there are other ways that cities are thinking and we're trying to help cities think creatively about strategies to support and build that pipeline, making sure, you know, what we hear is a shortage and making sure that there is um, a continual pipeline of workers that reflect the kids that they're being served. So a lot of cities are looking through it and working around mentorships and apprenticeship programs, leveraging some of the city departments and resources to really kind of establish that pipeline. And we're proud to say that a number of cities are taking upon some coaching and professional development as part of their um, city budgets to really help the workforce in terms of professional development, coaching, mentoring, and funding scholarships to pursue higher education and training. And so I think the more that we elevate this sector, connect it to economic development, and make sure that this sector is seen and heard, um, you know, there's other sectors that, um, you know, are very much front and center and top of mind for elected officials. And I think we can leverage what happened in COVID. Um, and it really was an awakening for many of our member cities that this sector and these work workers are essential and that it's not just a one time um, prior to you know, COVID, but also this is ongoing and sustainable and how do we look at this sector for long term planning at the city level. So we're excited about where we are. There's a lot of work to go, but we are building champions and partnerships that city governments are partnering with higher ed and, and K-12 and business community to develop and have these tables and making sure that the voices of providers are at that decision making table. So that's how some of the things that we're looking at um, at the National League of Cities and are excited to be part of this, this conversation and utilizing the data and the research that's been shared today to make the case for elected officials to make sure this is top priority for electeds at the local level. Thank you. Thank you, Tanja. You know, there, there are a couple of questions in the chat about providing uh, bonuses or, or more money for, for staff and, and worrying about whether or not that gets them to this, this cliff, this place where they aren't eligible for other benefits. Any comments anybody wants to make about that? Anybody? Yeah. So I think we're thinking about that sort of in the long term, in the short term in Virginia. I think there is a cliff, right? And we need to acknowledge that. I think we also, we said around setting our educator incentive that there's two kind of key factors. One, everybody's situation is unique, right? Um, and so like, it's very difficult at the state level to sort of ascertain exactly you know, who will be affected or not, but you should be really thoughtful when you advertise this and give information for folks to kind of think through that. And two, let it be folks' choice, right? So that, um, you know, we, we ultimately came back and said, we're gonna give as much as we can give and we will do a series of webinars, serving as technical assistance so folks understand, can think through tax implication, benefit implications while never giving that advice um, so that they can then make the choice for themselves um, in terms of whether they wanna sign up for that. I do think the kind of potential greater risk is around these one-time things, right? And so, I mean, ultimately, you know, we've, we've been sort of focused on how do you get to sustainable compensation through rates, right, rather than just the kind of one-time thing, because I do think the one-time creates both a little bit more risk and variation in your annual, uh, uh, how much you make, right, income, and then that kind of means you, you might, you know, get taxes back one year and not the next, and that has a set of implications. We're also on the eligibility side, 
keeping pushing the envelope. Um, I mean, there's a pretty big space. We're not focused on universal, but kind of continuing to expand who are the children who would be considered at risk of not having the opportunity to come to kindergarten ready. And we've really pushed up, um, you know, and, and, and largely that's been really important because we saw, you know, a very similar cliff effect around families that are eligible for for childcare or for pre-K or Head Start, and then there's this huge drop off. And you, you know, you might make a dollar more per hour, that's two thousand dollars over the year. That doesn't mean you can afford fourteen thousand dollars in childcare and pre-K for your kid, right? And so I think kind of pushing the system to think um, about where we also create those cliffs um, is uh, is really important. But I do think um, you know, we do want to make sure that that is the choice of the educators and try to get kind of these opportunities to them rather than saying, you know, let's not like jeopardize their, um, their benefits. But we, last part, I'll just note, we do work with a, uh, the Virginia Early Childhood Foundation, a private partner who really focuses on technical assistance for providers and educators as they sort through, will this put any of my benefits in jeopardy? Great, thanks, Jen. Because that leads to a question we've gotten around the role of public-private partnerships. Uh, so thinking about the state, the, the the municipal levels, and and certainly, what do we know from research? Has there do you know of this of a way in which public-private partnerships can be helpful, have been helpful, and and how can how can we enhance those? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll answer again and turn it to my, my colleagues. So we, a lot of the work in Virginia is a public-private research partnership that includes this private philanthropic statewide foundation who really helps us do the things, whether it's deeply engaged business, do the things that the state finds it harder to do and plays that role. Um, we then have government as a partner, and then we have our state flagship institution. And really important in terms of you know which which strengths and, and capabilities each entity brings to it. I think public private partnerships are important for business connections. I think public private partnerships give you more flexibility. And then I think the last piece that's really, really important is recognizing that the vast majority of our early childhood system is still privately funded. And so without getting too weedy, like we're very conscious, even as we increase the rate for childcare vouchers, it doesn't mean that every last classroom or every last child in those classrooms or family child care centers are funded. And so as we think about, so for instance, we are going to increase the rates this fall to reflect higher compensation. We are still going to have a voluntary wage scale and we're still going to be kind of, you know, sort of say we, we account for paying for more benefits, but make that voluntary. We'll give a six month grace period. We'll use a survey with our research partners to evaluate that and then kind of take it sort of step by step because we don't, want to inadvertently have folks say, I don't want to take public dollars because, you know, I that helps me pay for the wages for the 40% of my kids that are publicly funded, but my private market, which really my parents are paying all they can possibly pay, like I, I can't give there. And I think we're, we're hearing that, we're hearing that even the Virginia's increases in the minimum wage have created a ton of pressure there. So you have to remember that this is different. When we talk about schools and Head Start, as you mentioned with third grade teachers, if we fund the whole system, we can fund and we can bring expectations to line, but in a scenario where still the private market, our parents, you know, are paying more than 60% of the bottom line revenues, you need to tread very carefully on, on, on how we sort of both get higher income for teachers, but also not have unintended consequences around reducing access by basically saying, I can't afford to take private, you know, public dollars. Um, one last piece just to get on this one is, um, we did find that basically our through our research partnership that our publicly subsidized providers are having a much harder time than our private only child care providers because the state has been underpaying. So it really is um, their turnover rates are twice as much. They're finding it twice as hard to retain staff. Um, it is, you know, and it's twice as stressful as kind of some of the points that, that Anna made. And so really thinking about, you know, how the the public sector can do a better job funding the private side so they can be successful is 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 got to happen if we want to address compensation uh, across the board. Thanks. Could everybody come back on because I think it's time for a, a sort of group talk. Nice to see your faces all together. Uh, you know, Jenna gave me a, a good segue. So 
we look at the funding of early care and education, and we know it is it is heavily federally funded. I mean, there's all of these fragmented uh, sources of funding. And I, I, I wanted to get your thinking on how you think federal funding can be more effective, can be crafted in a different way. Uh, you know, you've got, you've suddenly got a magic wand and, and you can, we can recreate the federal structure so that funding of early care and education is, um, is what you think is appropriate. What would you do? What would it look like in an ideal situation, given the amount of federal funding that we have for this sector? Just thought I'd toss that out there. I would go, I would say equitable opportunities for all, regardless of if a childcare operation is in a low income area or in a high income area. At the end of the day, it's about the child and making sure that the child receives high quality services. And so I feel that it should be a way that all um, child care operations should receive some, uh, should receive um, equitable amounts of federal funding um, because a child doesn't ask to be here. A child doesn't ask to be in a high income area or a low income area. All, as we can see through COVID, all sectors had trouble, you know? It doesn't matter if you're high income or low income. So the children should not um, suffer at any hands. So equitable opportunities for all um, child care providers as family child care providers, faith-based providers, center providers, all providers. So I hear you saying, focus on the child. What do, what do children need? What's the cost of quality for children anywhere in the system and fund that? Absolutely. Including appropriate pay. Uh, Tanja, you're off mute. Yeah, I, I agree. I think you have to, I, it's unfortunate, but we're in a, an environment where everything is so politicized. And, and what we're finding is that many elected officials in, in more of a conservative side of, of, of life um, are weary. And you really have to make the case that they want to even accept and to, to receive the funds. Um, so I think the more that you can use the data like that was presented here today and, and tie it to um, the outcomes that you want to see for kids and families, but realistically too, and those bigger economic goals that, that really drive um, officials at every level of government, I think that's the key. But I just wanted to just acknowledge that politically, you know, we have to do some convincing for many officials to receive the funds. And, and, and some of that is warranted, like, you know, long-term, like there's a lot of, of concern about, you know, well, we get all this money right up front, then what? And after a couple of years, some of it is just political as well, that they just don't want to take it because of the administration or, you know, so I think the more we center families in well-being and, and the benefits to the community and to the larger goals um, around economic development, health, and safety. I think that's just going to be key. And, and that work has to be done first. I just wanted to just acknowledge that. Yeah, I would echo that I've had the fortune of working in very different political climates and have basically worked with every permutation of political affiliation for governor in both chambers of the legislatures across Louisiana and Virginia. You know, I do think that we have a model on the Child Care and Development Block Grant. All 50 states and, ter and sort of multiple territories accept it. Um, and it is this nice balance around, you know, here are the things that generally we want to be consistent across our country, but a ton of flexibility. And um, with that um, comes the ability for states to feel ownership, you know, to try different approaches and to do that. Um, I think the challenge is we've just never received enough, right? I've often sort of referred to as a child care block grant, the best block grant that most states have not maximized. Um, but it really, I think, provides a really powerful vehicle for states to kind of think about, well, how do I plug in state dollars around that? You know, we are focused, I think, also as Time United, around sort of trying to preserve in a very bipartisan way the work that's happening in Virginia. And it is a combination of access and choice, right? It is sort of quality and accountability. It is sort of supports for educators while also saying we want every child, um, as Julia very eloquently described, to have the opportunity to come to school ready. Um, and I think it is in sort of finding what's best about early childhood, it's a choice system, right? And we, from family childcare to big school divisions to Head Start who have you know deep, deep, deep community roots, 
um, to, you know, to big firm, you know, firms, to church-based childcare, like it is fundamentally an extraordinary choice system built on incredible commitments from in particular women across this country and women of color. And then figuring out how you bring the commitment, Jacqueline, as you described, to every family that it is affordable and accessible and quality um, and how we sort of professionalize and support those educators. It's somehow this marriage between what we like about the stability of the K-12 system, but don't want to have all in schools and what's unique and special about early childhood. And I really do think some kind of block grant format that both sort of creates a, this, a floor of what we expect, but also gives a ton of flexibility, seems to have the most potential in a period of time you described that's incredibly politicized. Uh, any of our researchers, either of our researchers, have any thoughts about this uh, role of the federal government? I have some thoughts. Um, I do. <laughs> surprise. One of the things that I would really like to see continue from the pandemic is the emphasis that we've seen from the administration from children and families on the importance of compensation. For many, many decades, um, there's been rightly an emphasis on the preparation of, of early educators and, and making sure that educators have the training that they need to do their work well. That's, very, that's still very important. Um, but for very long, you know, you listen for them to say something about compensation and there's crickets. And so I would, I would really love to see the federal government across um, all the funding streams that we have um, really emphasizing the importance. If you can't, you know, make requirements, then at least, in, you know, continue the encouragements and to say, you know, we're going to raise the funding, we're going to put dedicated funding um, toward compensation and really, um, you know, put the money where, where their mouth is and um, stop expecting programs to find money out of nowhere to pay educators better. Um, stop expecting parents to, to hold the burden of that. And Finally, stop expecting all the states and all the localities to try to figure out how to do this um, without enough funding. So um, if I had my magic wand, that's what I would do. Any other <laughs> magic wands out there? <laughs> Sorry, just to sort of tack on to what Caitlin was saying. I think a lot of times, as soon as folks want to talk about compensation, someone jumps in with education and training. and. I'm a developmental psychologist. I care a lot about the kids in the room and the experiences they're getting, but I find that very, very frustrating. Um, as if the women that are doing this work don't deserve more at a baseline and we don't need a reason to pay them more. They're already doing the job and they're already underserved. I also um, don't know that I hear enough in that conversation about what happens when you ratchet up um, education requirements without increasing that compensation. We have data out of Head Start that shows that the workforce became whiter with the passage of the 2007 Act that required the BA degrees. We don't talk about what's lost when we push certain educators out of the room. Um, and so I think when I think about that magic wand, I want to make sure, um, sort of echoing Caitlin, that we're having the compensation conversation first. And if that we're going to talk about other training and supports, I think a lot of educators in the room would love more training and support. Um, they, they care a lot about the kids in the room and they want to think about how do I do this better, right? So not to ignore that conversation, but to acknowledge that that can't happen outside of time, that can't happen outside of com uh, the compensation conversation. You compensate first, you think about how to make that training paid. You think about how to make that happen during work hours. So you're not asking these folks to do more on their own dime with the hope of maybe later making another 25 cents an hour. Yeah. Sorry, that was a little ranty. Apologies. Oh, oh good. Anybody else? Uh, and I, I guess for me, it's it's this fragmentation of the system at the federal level that's always been just maddening that you've got these, um, these funding streams that are reauthorized at different times that have different sets of qualifications and different sets of criteria. But as, as, as Caitlin mentioned, nowhere is there some place where the, it is explicitly stated that compensation would be, let's say, tagged to public school compensation. I mean, something like that. And so 
the cost of, of, of these programs is very much dependent upon how a, a budget can be structured. And it just seems to me, and you know, the, the things that I've seen, you can, you can get away with not paying teachers. You can, you can save money by just not, not giving them the money that they deserve. And I think what we've learned from the pandemic is you can do that, but they will walk away. <laughs> And they should have walked away a long time ago, in my opinion, because you can't ask people to work and not get paid. None of us do that. Uh, it is it, when you're looking at folks who are working full time at a really challenging job and on public assistance, uh, there's something just sort of ethically wrong with that. So how we craft a system in which it is clear to us that this is important work that we're gonna do everything we can, as Anna said, to, to really support teachers, but at the same time, pay people what the job is worth. And what the job is worth really is very much from my perspective, aligned if not beyond what public school teachers made. You know, when we talk about, and I'd, I'd like to hear some of your thoughts around this notion of compensation. We say compensation. But when you think about it, public school teachers get the summers off. Uh, and some of those teachers of early care and education, they, they're working year round. Uh, so have there been any, any places where you've been thinking about what it means to have a compensation package? Jalitha, you mentioned retirement packages. I mean, I'm wondering if you thought about what that looks like and, and is it just the same salary as a public school teacher, or is it is it more than that? And how do you how do we get to that? It's my hard question for everybody. Yes, I have thought about that and how, um, like right now, as we all know, states are receiving um, incredible amounts of funding. So right now it's, diff it's time to innovate. And when I speak about, um, especially um, in, in the realm of family chakras, so I could speak on that, like um, investing in associations to create um, um, United, like plans with United Healthcare for their members because family child care providers are a silo, they're individual business owners. And so sometimes how can you buy into a plan? So when I talk about that, that's what I'm talking about. Or when I talk about um, increasing subsidies that equal the cost of quality, when states are forming um, plans to um, uh, re their re to um, to decide their reimbursement rates, think about how much the cost of quality is. That means how much is that actual individual family child care business owner needs to pay to set aside to pay for taxes? How do how can she pay into Social Security? Um, so think about that when we are um, creating, um, you know, our subsidy reimbursement rates. And so, and to speak to, I think Aunt, what Ann said, um, also making the profession look like a profession speaking highly of a profession. Um, and that will help with um, increasing our weight Wait, uh, wages and retaining people here because sometimes people think, oh, you work in childcare, that's just childcare, that's just babysitting. No, it's an essential service that you need to go to work. Family childcare providers and center owners and directors provide through opportunities, right? They provide opportunities for women to work. They provide opportunities for women to run businesses. They provide opportunities for the workforce to go to the um, to go to work. And also, every position in childcare is is needed. That's from the bus driver. That is the um, the secretary, the director, and the owner, the teacher. Um, so do not make a difference in those different positions, and also promote the other positions within the childcare sector. So if I I'm not a family childcare provider, practicing family childcare provider anymore, but I do work for a national organization. See, there's different career pipelines. So promote that, and that will help to have um, to make our profession look um, like any other profession, like the nursing profession, right? You have the CNA, you have the LVN, you have the RN, and then also you have respiratory tech, all that. So let's promote um, family child care and center owner and director um, center positions, just like we promote any other um, industry. Why? Because we care and educate all industries children in our industry deserves the respect and the titles that um that we work for every single day we're sending jolita on the road 
<laughs> so Jack, Jacqueline, I, I just want just briefly, um, within Illinois, we're currently working on, there was a mention of cost modeling. Mm -hmm. And so we are looking at compensation. I'm not able to, you know, um, give full, full details because it's in development, but uh, cost modeling and looking at, uh, you know, we talk about K-12, but we're actually looking outside of the profession because what we know now is that there are other sectors that are actively recruiting individuals within, within our profession because we, we have certain knowledge, skills, and dispositions that are desirable within other sectors that they have not been able to hire for that they are experiencing shortages. And so we are looking at other sectors and other, uh, you know, as comparison, as far as, as modeling and not staying, you know, just within, you know, the education, uh, the education sector. Interesting. One last little thing I think to add on, on, on that, you know, is make sure whenever you present your data and how your programs are funded, that you do it at the hourly rate. So when we, we moved to funding our mixed delivery preschool, which is our, when we fund the full classroom of, in, the, in the private childcare setting, our analog to state pre-K, and it's 12,000 to 17,000 a kid relative to the roughly 7,000 per kid in state pre-K. That creates immediate sticker shock. Then you look at the hours, state pre-K is 990 hours a year, full day, full year, you know, sort of 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., is about 2,800 hours, right? And so then you actually look at the hourly rate and you'll see, well, gosh, those aren't different. And I think that's really, really important. We often look at annualized salary, to your point, Jacqueline, about sort of teacher salaries in 10 months versus 12 months and annualized funding rates. But that's not, that's like apples to like antelopes, right? In terms of like hugely different mm -hmm. and really thinking about as we sort of look at a sustainable funding model if parents need 2,800 hours a year of custodial care and education that supports the learning and development, we have to fund the compensation that supports that, right? We have to fund that, that practice. And I think that's really, that kind of helps address um, some of the kind of the things where like people have sticker shock on the price tag. You can't outsource this. It's a market failure in terms of it's based on what parents can pay. And ultimately parents, right in Virginia, for kids under six, over 70% have all available parents in the workforce. And, you know, the vast majority of those parents are not working between, you know, nine and three, right? We need way more than 990 hours of coverage. And so really making sure that we fully account for what the full day, full year looks like if we actually want to compensate educators and then getting that kind of hourly rate right, as well as the benefits. Yeah, I think that's so important, Jenna. It's the, the scope of of early care and education is enormous and how much time we need to do it all year round. And as you say, these jobs are not gonna be able to ship, be shipped overseas, they're right here. Uh, I, I, and as we learned during the pandemic, you also can't do them all on a computer. That is true, <laughs> we, we did Any learn. parent who had a child between <laughs> birth and three knows how well virtual preschool or childcare works. <laughs> Anna, you're off mute, did you have a? Yeah, I think for me, the other thing is that this is why it's so important to keep the conversation tailored around childcare and to keep birth to five as a united conversation. So I think there's a lot of push to like, let's do preschool. Let's like, I know in California, we're about to make universal TK. And I think that's great. It is three hours a day. It is three hours a day. And that's very, very hard for parents. And that's going to sort of pluck folks out of the childcare system while still putting an enormous strain on that system because they're going to be all these families that expect to have somewhere to send their child to go for these off hours a day. Um, and so I think, you know, making sure to continue to talk about like, this is, uh, this is what parents need. We never think about school as childcare spaces, but it absolutely is a childcare space and sort of continuing to have this united conversation and to not let it be a pre-K conversation, let it be, you know, a birth to five conversation is really essential. Thank you. I just, I want to throw this out. Have any of you had any experience with early childhood teachers being unionized? Um, anybody know any places where that's happened? And what that might look like? No place. Huh? Well, just to give a shout out to Drulitha's crowd. Um, you know, <laughs> the home based providers have been organizing um, and unionizing in several states. 
I don't know, Drew Lisa, if you have any personal experience or if you want to say more about it, but just wanted to flag um, that there has been that movement amongst the home-based side of things. So, no, I don't have detailed information about it, but I do know um, family child care providers in California are very active and have made um, significant strides in that direction. And so um, if you look up California Family Child Care Associations and Networks, they have really done some groundwork on um, moving forward with um, unions in their state. Interesting. I, because I don't know of a place where that's been a real, a real push and we could get some data, but it would be very interesting to see what that would look like. Okay. Well, I'll say a little bit. I mean, of course, it's not the solution because that's only some, it's only part of the ACE sector for home-based and it's not all home-based providers. Um, but as Julie mentioned in California and, and in other places like Massachusetts, um, you know, these folks are banding together and are, are able to win benefits for themselves. Um, you know, they, in Massachusetts, they have to have, um, you know, paid leave uh, that they wouldn't have otherwise. They basically said the state is their employer for this purpose. Um, so, you know, again, it's not for everybody, but for those folks that have been able to come together and really say, like, together we are powerful and we need this. Um, you know, it, it can be a good strategy for those folks. We, we are four minutes from time. And um, I just have one more question for you guys. You know, we taught, there's a poll, all right. So focus and content of the webinar, met my needs. So if you would just fill out this poll, that would be lovely. I think that's the, the intent as it popped up here on the screen. But for the panelists, you know, we've heard a lot about things at the federal, state, and municipal levels. Could you say a few words as we end this about the role of leadership at whatever level, if it's, um, if it's federal, if it's state, if it's municipal? Because that seems to me to be really an interesting piece that we don't talk about. And regardless of political party, because I think early childhood should be a bipartisan issue, uh, you know, leadership changes. We live in a political environment, but things change, but what is what is important for early care and education as you think about leadership at your state, at your city? What do we need to do to help leaders support this work more? They're thinking. I would say direct investment in leadership development programs for family child care um, educators. Um, NFACC, we have a leadership program, Leaders Shaping Leaders, where we um, focus on the family child care provider building up her leadership skills, um, public policy, advocacy, and financial literacy. So making sure that they are able and they are equipped with the tools and resources to speak at forums like this, making sure that they are equipped with the tools and resources to speak at local levels, state levels, and federal levels. So investing in the family child care provider and her leadership and civic engagement skills. Also, on the other hand, for the actual providers, it is our duty and your responsibility to participate and to speak up. Your voice is your currency. So no one can tell us what our profession needs better than the actual practitioner her, herself or himself, right? And also to leadership, make sure that you call on the family child care providers, center owners and directors and staff members who do this work every single day. Call on us. Why? Because we are the experts in this field. We know what we need and we can and we will and we will step up to speak in forums like this in forums at state, local, and federal levels. We can and we will do it. And also, so and just inviting more providers like you have did uh, me, um, I can't be did myself to forums like this um, and, and, and talking about what they need, what they want, and how they can participate in the field of early care and education. So building a strong pipeline of, of, of leaders who can advocate for themselves. And I think that's really an important exactly. piece. Uh, thank you. That's, that's really important. Anybody else? I, I can't top what Julia said about the leadership piece and the real importance of deeply involving uh, folks who are doing this as well as families. And we know it's really hard to engage families who are so busy, but I've never had better family engagement than I had at my children's childcare centers. And so really kind of doing that, the kind of 
a total flip on that is <laughs> I'm a, I think the sector needs more folks to think about the fiscal and operational implications and how do we support that. I mean, so much of the behavior I've seen, if you look at QRISs across the country, like it's completely predictable based on the economics. We spend 90% of our time talking about quality, but when I actually spend time with incredible providers like Julie, like their behavior is 90% guided by economics and the state's licensing guidelines. <laughs> And so really thinking through the extent to which we sort of are right sizing some of our conversations and focus and making sure that we've got, you know, the, the best minds focusing on how to get that right rate as really to describe in terms of child care subsidy, how to think about, you know, the kind of maximum efficiency and to get the right rate on benefits and retirement um, and doing that. Um, and then I think there is a reconciliation around health and safety. How do we keep like, absolutely as the parent of three young children want to keep kids healthy and safe but I'm struck by, I talked to provider after provider and so much of their brain space is dedicated to licensing regulations yeah. and maybe less so on the kind of fiscal implications, how to set the right rates, how to kind of collect and, and, um, and, so, and, and how to focus on quality. We are at time and I just want to thank all of you for just a great discussion and you. your engagement has been terrific. Uh, what we have to do is get more money for early childhood professionals yes. and not just more money, but the money that they absolutely deserve. So yes. I'm turning this over to, to Hattie. Are you on next? Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you so much to our panelists, to our researchers and to Dr. Jones for moderating this conversation. I don't know that I've ever seen a more uh, active chat in a webinar. And I'm so glad that I was able to be a part of this conversation and to hear from everybody who joined us today everything that was shared um, in terms of resources in the chat will be sent out in the follow-up materials and once again just thank you to everybody for your contributions both in today's conversation and, and in your work really appreciate it one more time for our participants um, before you take off take a look at our upcoming webinars over the next uh, few weeks and we hope to see you back soon. Thanks everyone, have a great rest of your day.